believe in yourself For that's the place to start Start in dancing Hey, what a wonderful kind of day You're the fan, and I'm Ramin. All right, so in today's video, we are going to start a series on quantum theory. Um, I'll do my due diligence to not really want to get into the mathematical abstraction of the formalism. We'll talk a little bit about it, but we really want to talk about this new quantum logic that is really not new. It's about 100 years old at this point. And in this first video, we we're going to cover the most basic um, case to understand, which comes from a stern Gerlach experiment, which was performed about a hundred years ago or so, right? It was performed um, in about the 1920s, I think 1927, or, you know, something of that nature, right? And in this experiment, a lot of wonky things became apparent, and we will need to talk about the need for interpretations. Um, at the end, we'll cover the main interpretation, and then one I enjoy. There are a lot more interpretations out there, and I will cover those more in a, in a dedicated video. But for this first video, we're just going to get acquainted with some logic of the quantum world, right? And before we go into the quantum world, let's get our juices flowing in our head, right? Let's talk about some intuitions from our everyday lives. So I want you to picture things in your head when I'm talking about them, right? So get your mind's eye ready for this one, right? So I want you to picture yourself throwing a ball at a wall. So, you know, you have a ball, throw it at the wall, throw it at the wall, throw it at the wall, right? And if you do this, you will notice that, okay, the ball sometimes goes up here, the ball sometimes goes down here, the ball goes down down here. And if you recorded it, you would say, okay, cool. I get a lot of different things depending on how hard I throw the ball, this or that, right? Lucky for us, <laughs> this is um, known, right? You can actually determine exactly where the ball will go if you have enough information about this. This is known as a deterministic theory, right? Because if I have enough information about how I throw the ball, I can determine exactly where it will go. So we call this determinism, or we would classify the ball throwing as a deterministic theory. Okay, great. Not too hard, right? You, you you could even go out there and perform this experiment if you wanted to. You would see that, cool, I can throw it. We're not going to talk about the math of it, but just knowing this is a complete theory. Okay. So now let's turn our attention to what I have in front of us, right? If you look over here, I have a, a weird-looking experiment, right? Um, we have something with two things. One arrow is pointing up, one arrow is pointing down. We have some measurement to the side, right? This is what the stern gerlach experiment setup is, right? And the stern gerlach experiment, what it measures is it measures where we send an electron, or actually in this case, a silver atom, um, and we send it through a magnetic field, but not just any magnetic field. We have two permanent magnets sitting inside of this thing that's labeled Z, right? And inside the Z, we have a magnet with the north pole exposed and we have a magnet with the south pole exposed so in your head you should be picturing there's one end of a bar magnet here one end of a bar magnet here very simple experiment right um of course if you actually performed it in the real world you have to heat up your silver atoms which is what that thing on the left side of the z is it's it's an oven it heats up your atom then you have to like specify exactly how your beam is going to get shot through there, which is known as a co-limiter because you're limiting the range of these uh, this gases state going out, etc. Right? But we're not actually need to perform it because thanks to the physics department at Oregon State University, they devised a computational experiment. Right? But just know, just know, you can go in the lab and do this yourself. Right? And you probably should if you're like getting into more experimental side of physics, you probably should go do this. But um, I digress, right? So let's talk about the weirdness of this, right? Unlike the ball throwing experiment, we only ever get two results. That's kind of crazy, right? We only get two results. And not only do we only get, what that literally means is think back to your ball throwing thing, right? We're saying that as the atoms move through this thing, right? They never go straight down the middle, right? There's never a chance of it going straight down the middle. It always gets deflected, 
up or down, which is there, okay, Rami, that's obvious, right? It's a magnet, right? It's going to influence the atom. It's going to go up or down. But the crazier thing about it is it only hits in two exact places every single time every single time. So let's run the experiment, right? So I'm going to go ahead and run this, the first uh, stern lock experiment. And lucky for us, we don't actually have to turn on an atom. We don't have to like limit our beams. We don't have to set up the experiment. We can just hit go, right? So let's let it run for a little bit. And cool, we have 397 of the atoms got deflected up and 372 of them got deflected down. And so that's pretty interesting, right? It's basically a 50-50 split as if you were flipping a coin. Right? If you flip a coin enough times, you will get a 50-50 distribution, right? And we're seeing the exact same thing here. Very interesting, right? And it's very weird, right? First off, we're only getting two results when, in the real world, we're getting a huge range of where it's going to hit on the wall. But not only do we get a huge range of where it's going to hit on the wall, we know that if I have enough information about how fast you're throwing the ball, if there's wind, if there's this, if there's that, right? If you have enough information about it, you can determine exactly where it will land. And so you might apply the same logic here, right? You say, okay, the two results is still wonky, right? It's still wonky, but maybe, maybe it's just because we're ignorant. Maybe it's just because we're ignorant to all the information that's known to the system. Maybe if I had knew just a little bit more, a little bit more, I could figure out exactly um, how to determine its path, right? And this is known as hidden variable models because of that very aspect. It's like there must be something hidden that we just don't know, right? Um, we will cover this in a later video, but hidden variable models have been ruled out due to a very, very smart guy by the name of John Bell. And he devised these theorems called the Bell theorems, which lead to the Bell inequalities, which talk about how you can't have hidden variable theories that can determine this, but I digress. That's for a later video. I'm just giving you a little sprinkling of, you know, actual truth. So we go ahead and we say, cool, maybe, maybe it's just ignorance, right? So let's do a new experiment, right? Let's do a new experiment where I only, I'm only going to take one. I'm only going to take one of, I'm only gonna take one of the results, right? So instead of going here, right? Instead of going up to this analyzer here, I'm going to introduce a new analyzer, right? And I'm going to change it. So instead of saying it's on Z, I'm going to change it to a do new place, and I'm going to change it to, um, we're going to say X, okay? So what this means, if you're thinking about this, I, like I said, I don't want to talk too much about the math, but essentially what this is, is this Z means we're measuring it on the Z axis, right? This X means we're going to be measuring it on the X axis, right? So just pick an axis in your head, look at the wall. You say up or down a Z, it's just on a different axis, right? And so if you look closely, what we're doing here is we're doing that exact concept. We're saying, cool. Well, now, now I do know it's spin up, right? So before you can, you can plead ignorance. So, oh, you can't know before you measure. That's stupid. I mean, you got, you got to measure to know if it's going to be spin up or spin down, right? You got to measure. You got to measure. Cool. I agree, right? Let's, just, let's, let's plead ignorance. So now let's run it again, right? So we're only going to be taking the spin up part. So the one atoms that get deflected up, we're only going to take them and let's rerun this experiment. Uh, wait a second. <laughs> Whoa. What is that I'm seeing on the X axis? I'm getting a another 50, 50 split. That's wild, right? So it's almost as if knowing that it was spin up prior, did not matter in this new measurement? That is super wonky. Right. And so let's do some more experiments like this is this is getting very, very wonky. Right. So now we're almost seeing as if it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I knew the prior results. Right. It's almost as interactions change. Right. It's almost as if in the interaction with my new detector changed what was known. Right. So knowing that it was spin up told me nothing about where we'll go in a new area. But even wonkier, even, even, it's going to get even wonkier, right? What we're going to do next is let's do a new experiment, right? And let's say, okay, Ramin, you got me there, right? You got me there. This new logic's a little bit wonky. Um, but I guarantee if we sent it back to the same axis, back to the Z, only taking spin up, we're going to get spin up back. So let's, let's 
let's do the default experiment once again, right? And um, we're gonna have two detectors, so we're gonna send it through the x-axis again, right? Um, and then we're gonna send it back to the z. And let's see what happens here, right? So do do do, we're going through the x, do do do, we're gonna send you over here, and let's see the results we get. Okay, so once again. We know on the z-axis it measures spin-up. We're only taking those ones. On the x-axis, we're doing the same thing. We're only going to take spin-up, right? And so to prove that to you, we will get the results down here, right? So I say, cool, I want to record the results. I'll get spin down. And let's see what happens. Let's see what happens here. Whoops. Will this move? Okay, cool. Let's see what happens here. So let's run this experiment. And let's stop it here. Let's stop it here right? And if you might have been noticing the ratios, by the way, right, this is still 50-50, so half the results still go spin down, a quarter of them go spin down here, and then we get an eighth of them being spin up and spin down. Pretty wonky, right? Um, well, actually, I, I, I shouldn't say those exact distributions. I would have to, like, look at it. I, my intuition says that, but who cares at this point, right? But the wildest thing is just that. The interaction changed the orientation of the actual electron every single time, right? We took only spin up electrons, we sent it back to the same axis, and wonky enough, it wasn't spin up again. We got the same distribution. So these electrons that had the option of being deflected up or down, right, if there were predetermined information about it, would have been shown here. Right? If there's something predetermined about this electron, it would always be spin up in this last case, right? Interaction shouldn't matter. You told me that on the first interaction, the first detector spin up, why is it not spin up again? It's weird, right? And this last experiment is probably, I think, the coolest one, but it's also one of the more wonkier ones if you take one of the main interpretations. So let's rerun this experiment. But in this time, instead of just taking the spin up from the x axis, let's take both, right? Let's send both beans back to the first axis, right? And you'll see something pretty wonky happen there now. So cool, we're gonna set this up again. Do do, we'll call this x. Do do, we'll call this z. If I could bring it down, here we go, right? So we say cool, I send you to here, if I can link them up. And I send you over there, and I'll get a new bar. Because remember, we only need two bars here. We only need two results, right? Because we're sending you both of these results. So we're, we're going to be deflecting both of the beans back to the original detector or the z-axis, right? If I could, I would rewire them back, but, you know, this app wouldn't allow me to do that. So let's go ahead and combine our counters now. So you ready for this? Let's go. And isn't that super interesting? Right? It's almost as if each spin, each direction has unique information associated with it. Right? It was only when I took both spin up and spin down on that middle detector and sent it back to our original detector do I get back the 50 50 result? Do I get back that the electron remembered? Oh, wait, huh, silly me, I was spin up. Right? So let's try to conclude. Let's try to get some some sense of what's happening here, right? Um, according to these experiments, the electron has the same probability of being deflected up or down, right? Okay, we saw that, right? So originally it was a 50-50 split. Knowing that it was deflected up or down does not help me determine future orientations when interacting with new objects. That was what the second experiment showed us, right? What this is known as in the physics world, or even you know, the math world, this is called a commutator relationship. Um, this happens in the quantum realm very often, and all it means is like you can only know certain pieces of information about your quantum state at a certain time. And quantum state is just the abstraction of what we just learned, right? So we're talking about electron spin, that is a type of quantum state. So you abstract this to, because there's many things you can measure, right? It's not just electron spin being up or down, you can measure where is the electron, how fast the electron moving, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we'll talk about what those are called, those are known as observables. So we'll talk about observables in a later video. But for now, we'll call them quantum states, call them observables, call them what you want, right? And now, 
we have to kind of talk about what what does it mean, right? Well, how does quantum theory actually predict this stuff? Like, go back to the theory of throwing the wall, the ball on the wall, right? We know that's a deterministic theory, but it's almost as if quantum mechanics is not deterministic, right? There is nothing I can do to determine what is going to be the next result, right? And so in the quantum world, in order to get the correct results, we have to assume two things, right? Um, the first one is something known as Born's rule, right? And this is just a mathematical thing you have to assume, and it has to deal with how you weigh your probability. So like in this case, because it was a one half, one half, we would write this as one over the square root of two, and we would put them on both spin up and spin down. So we would say, cool, according to Born's rule, we weigh them based off of the results we see, right? The second one, which we will discuss in a little more detail, is the concept of superposition, right? And you might have heard this concept before because it does pop up in electromagnetism very often, and it has to do with how things, which we call vectors, add up, right? And so if you have these fields, you can actually add the contribution of both fields at a certain point, and it's just the sum of the fields at that point, right? That's known as superposition, right? Um, and we say mathematically that these states are in that superposition. At that point of measurement, before we took the measurement, it's almost as if they both occupy the same position, right? And I like to say in a different way. I like to say they have the same urgency. So a superposition in the quantum world means they have the same urgency. Both are just, and in, in just in this example, right? Um, just in the electron spin case. You will see there, there are other stuff in the quantum world where some things have like a two-third probability versus a one-third probability. You can start looking at like decays of unstable nuclei and things like that. They have different probability results, which means they have different weighings, which means it's not always 50-50, right? We picked this experiment because of the easy way to digest it. 50-50, easy to digest. So they both have the same urgency. So let's pause here. That's all math, right? And this is why a lot of physicists, by the way, get confused, in my opinion, right? A lot of them like to say that math is physical, right? I don't like to say that. I don't agree with that because we can try a better way of examining these things physically. So let's go ahead and do that, right? What does this superposition stuff really mean physically, right? Is there some type, like I said, we can't, we, we aren't going to talk about hidden variables, by the way. Um, as much as when I was younger, I loved hidden variables, right? But we can't really talk about them if you take John Bell's experiments seriously. We have to ignore them. So, so we have to find a way to interpret these results. Okay. So, um... Let's just repeat once again what is here because it, it, it bears repeating because it is very wonky, right? We saw that electrons have no meaning prior to an interaction. Even once they interact with that detector, it has no bearing on future interactions. Mathematically, we have this wonky superposition concept, but we must ask some kind of philosophical questions here, right? You tell me it's in a superposition, Ramin, but uh, why don't I ever see it in one? Why do I only ever see it in a spin up or spin down? You're telling me that mathematically, and, 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 talk, and I'm not even talking to myself right now, I'm talking to you know those physicists who may see this video that want to justify, oh, math, math is reality, blah, 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 blah. But why do I never see your math in reality? Right? You're telling me it's in a superposition, but how convenient, right? How convenient that I can never measure this superposition, right? But even worse, guys, even worse is the people that kind of came up with these theories came up with a very easy way out. And it came from mainly from this school of Copenhagen, right? And the interpretation is called that. It's called the Copenhagen interpretation. And this is, is truly the most standard way physicists do it. And basically what they say is, uh, stop asking. <laughs> Your calculations get the correct results. The formalism works. Um, clearly, we just don't know how to handle this wonkiness, but why do you care? And why should you care, right? We are predicting things correctly, and 
to a degree that has never been seen before, right? If you take quantum field theory to its limits, guess what? You're predicting things to accuracies that has previously been impossible to do, right? So using the quantum formalism, I'm getting, I'm calculating the correct probabilities. My experiments are seeing exactly what I'm calculating. So you, all you need to do, and this is a famous saying in physics, is shut up and calculate, right? Shut up. Stop talking about all this stupid superposition jargon into mathematical formalism. Um, and that's why a lot of physicists, like I said, they get lost in the sauce, right? They, they truly believe that the math is the physical reality, right? And it's really hard to go against it, right? Because uh, unfortunately, I can never experimentally show that the superposition is what's actually happening in reality due to the wonkiness of what we just experienced. But man is it working yeah it's working so they're kind of out of place and that's why it's the best and most standard way to look at the world however i like the second one this is my preferred one um and it's because i do like enjoying these things i don't want to just shut up and calculate i like to find ways of trying to interpret these things in different ways and so just for a time frame thing um all of these debates initially happened in the 1920s 1930s um, Einstein was involved in them, Schrodinger was involved with them, Heisenberg was involved with them, Dirac was involved in them. There's a lot of big names of physics that was involved in these, right? Um, and so we come to a point in the 1950s, this guy called uh, Everett, and he has a new interpretation. He has a new way of looking at the formalism. And he never called it this, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna give him his due diligence. I'm gonna call it the first one, it's just the Everettian interpretation. But one of my idols, Bryce DeWitt, he coined it a different way. He called it the many worlds interpretation. And the reason I like this one is it, it kind of makes sense to me, right? If we kind of zoom in on that third experiment, we know that we need both deflections in order to return what we knew previously, right? If I cut off that deflection down on the, on the third experiment and sent it back to the original detector, I didn't get back my spin up that I knew. But funny enough, Funny enough, when I did throw that information back on the first detector, I got to spin up again, right? And to me, to me, that means there is unique information associated with both, super, both parts of the superposition, right? It's unique. And even furthermore, even furthermore, I like to think about it this way. Let's, let's get away from our human experiments. So let's go look at atoms real fast. Atoms have a very cool rule, right? And this is called as Pauli's exclusion principle. And what Pauli figured out was, hmm, in order to go up on the energy levels in atoms, right, for the electrons orbits, quote unquote, you need both a spin up and a spin down electron. So if atoms are telling me that I need both spin up and spin down, it kind of showcases that it has to have unique information. Otherwise, these fermions, that's, by the way, that's just a fancy way of talking about these particle types. These spin one half, that's also another fancy way of talking about these particle types. I'm just getting you, you know, used to this jargon, right? Is that if the spin up and spin down didn't have unique information associated with them, how could the atoms determine if one spin up or spin down, right? They're, they don't have magnetic bars in them, right? supposedly right we can talk about we'll, we'll talk about that in a different video about like quantum magnetism and all that fun stuff right but for right now we're going to take it as they don't have bar magnets there right so atoms see something different between spin up and spin down the third experiment saw something unique with spin up and spin down there has to be some type of information that's unique to both spin up and spin down right if you take the superposition thing seriously that's kind of what it says as well right so that information still exists in the universe. And that's how I describe many worlds information. Uh, sorry, that's how I describe many worlds. It's essentially that. What is not measured still exists, right? Bryce D. Witt took it further than I personally take it, right? Bryce D. Witt, he, he, he famously said, well, I don't know if it's famous. Well, he did say that it's so weird because I do not feel myself splitting over and over and over and over, right? But according to the formulism, that's what happens, right? And so essentially the way you want to think about it or the way Bryce D. Witt thought about it and the people who do enjoy many worlds think about it is in our universe, we get spin up. 
but branches off into a new universe that spin down information, right? Because it didn't measure in our universe, means it's gone. We can't interact with it anymore, so it goes off into its own universe. And that's why that's called many worlds interpretation, right? And it makes the most sense to me, right? There, I, I really believe there has to be unique information associated with every type of superposition in the quantum realm. And that kind of concludes, I think that's a pretty good stopping point. Um, that concludes this episode. Uh, I think in the next one, I'll talk about quantum entanglement, very fun concept. Um, and we, and just know that I don't take the shut up and calculate thing. So we will get some philosophical stuff going and hopefully you enjoyed it, right? And if you did enjoy this video, give me some money, right? <laughs> if you're rich, right? If you're poor or you're, you're a student, please, please, for the love of God, save your money. You don't want to end up poor like me, right? So save your money, um, invest, do some stuff if you're still poor. But if you have some money to throw around, hey, give me some money. I'm poor. Um, I'm a poor graduate student. Um, lost my funding. So that's why I'm making these videos. So hopefully you enjoy. And like I said, in the next episode, we will be talking about quantum entanglement. And probably after that, we'll be talking about observables. And we'll get into a little more meaty quantum stuff. Um, so with that being said, have a good rest of your day or night or week or whenever I upload. I'm trying to upload. I'll try. I'll try to upload almost daily, right? I'll try to just churn out these videos because it's, it's fresh on my mind. I love this stuff um, and hopefully makes sense to you. All right, peace out.